Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. Now, many of you may be aware that uh, currently there's this thing going on. There's this, um, there's this taste of revival that seems to have uh, started again here in the U.S. Uh, started at Asbury Seminary, uh, where a big thing happened. It, was just, it started as just like a normal chapel service and some worship uh, with prayer and a call to seek the Lord. Um, but then just some students began to stir. God was stirring their hearts, and they came back, and then it built to from several to hundreds to thousands to now tens of thousands that have swelled uh, in the area, and it has spread uh, beyond Asbury to a number of places. And uh, maybe not everybody's familiar with the idea of a revival. So with the idea of a revival, there is this supernatural sense of the presence of God. Uh, people are uh, seeking him diligently in the midst of this. They want to hear from him. God's word is being read. People are responding to to it, people are getting saved. I mean, just some crazy stuff going on. And so we just rejoice uh, that God has started something. And I would say, you know, may it continue to spread throughout our country and capture the hearts of people uh, all over, turning them back to the Lord. That, was, that would be a beautiful thing. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that you can partner just in this, uh, maybe a, a movement, but here locally. Um, one of those is that we have a a prayer uh, chain that we're a part of that's a part of uh, other churches here in Columbia. So there's a group of churches in Columbia that have um, promised each other that we would pray for our city and we all made a commitment to take one day of the month and pray for 24 hours that day. And so our day is the 20th of the month. And so we have set up a place for you to sign up online. If you go to our website, sandhillschurch.org, the second banner down is a place to sign up for, um, to commit to pray for in 15 minute segments on the 20th. And you can just go there, sign up and uh, join with others in our church body that are just gonna pray for Columbia. And that's our main focus is Columbia. And I would say specifically pray for revival in Columbia, that our hearts would be drawn to the Lord, that we would seek him faithfully. Uh, and then also the third Monday of every month, which would be tomorrow, third Monday of every month at Sand Hills, we have a prayer night. And so if you would like to pray tomorrow night, be here at seven o'clock tomorrow night, we will gather and seek the face of the Lord here at Sand Hills. So tomorrow night at seven. And all of this happens because of the, the biggest thing that has ever happened in all of history, uh, the resurrection, which is what we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bibles handy, turn to uh, Mark chapter 15, and we'll start in verse 42. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. So by the time we get to Mark 15, 42... We are, uh, we're, we're on the day of the resurrection. So we have had, uh, the Friday was when Jesus was arrested, beaten, crucified, placed in a tomb. He was in the tomb throughout the Sabbath. And then after that, uh, he rose on the third day. And so uh, this is where we are in Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 42. And this is actually, uh, this is the, the culmination of what was known as the Passion Week. So the Passion Week, you, you probably heard of the Passion of the Christ. It's a reference to the suffering of Christ. It's not a reference to love. It's a reference to suffering. And uh, so this is Jesus in processing his suffering. Um, okay, by the time we get to Mark 15, 42, uh, let's just read a couple of verses here. Mark 15, starting verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. All right, so this is all in the context of what I would say is the death of hope. Because you had all these disciples, you had all these people rallied up, they were following Jesus, they were pumped, like he's the Messiah, he's gonna take over, he'll boot Rome out of here, he'll set up his throne, he will lead, conquer, God's people will reign forever and ever, amen. And it didn't happen. Uh, the Messiah they were trusting in was uh, arrested and murdered. I mean, he was killed. And uh, it was just a horrible event. And so his body was hung on a cross, and it stayed there as they watched him die. Uh, it was just a horrible moment. And they all thought that he was the one who was going to finally restore Israel. Now, according to Roman law, if you got to the point where you were guilty of capital punishment uh, and they, they killed you, your body was was forfeit at that point. I like you. None of your possessions uh, remained with your family. The government could come. They just took all your possessions because you were no longer entitled to them because you were guilty of capital punishment. They came in and killed you. Um, and then your body had no rights, uh, meaning really they would just leave you on this this crude cross and they let the wild animals and the birds have at you until you were done. Uh, it's really gruesome. And if you can imagine just walking by that consistently as a part of your culture. Uh, but it's what Rome did to instill terror into people, to say, you don't 
you don't disobey us, you don't re rebel against us, or this will happen to you. And so just a really gruesome thing. Um, but occasionally, if you had a kind magistrate uh, leading your area, like in this case, perhaps Pilate, who I wouldn't describe as kind, but anyway, uh, a family member could come along and say, may we have the body of one that was crucified? And normally they would let you do that just to get rid of some of the people that were hanging out there. And so um, that's why when Joseph of Arimathea comes and makes a request, Pilate is gonna be lenient towards him. And to be fair, Pilate, though not a nice guy, uh, he didn't think Jesus was guilty. I mean, like he had him crucified, but it was because the Jews made him do it. He felt like Jesus was also a victim of the Jews, which he has felt like he has been since he's been serving them. And so uh, when Joseph comes along, Pilate is gonna be inclined to let him take the body. And, and that's what we see here. Um, Joseph uh, was also, it says here, he was a, a respected member of the council. That's a reference to him being a part of the Sanhedrin. And if you remember the Sanhedrin, the highest religious ruling body in Israel was who condemned Jesus in the first place. So here he is a part of the very system that condemned Jesus. But Joseph wasn't on board with this. And that's what we see uh, written in Luke chapter 23. Luke 23 says, now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. So Joseph is a secret follower of Jesus. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't come out during all the proceedings. He may have voted against it, but he didn't come out uh, and, and announce his love of Christ. And he worked also with somebody else. He didn't do this alone. He grabbed a partner and he brought a guy with him named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, you might have heard about. Nicodemus is responsible for the most famous verse in all of Scripture, so to speak. Uh, what's the most famous verse in all of Scripture, do you think? John 3.16. And who was it Jesus was speaking to when those words came to be? But Nicodemus himself. Nicodemus sought him out by night, talked to him, and... Uh, and he now shows up with Joseph of Arimathea. We know that because of what goes in John chapter 19. So John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42 says this. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took away his body. Now Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Uh, Matthew would go on to tell us that this was actually the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had made for himself and his family. And so this is his tomb he had just had made, and they put Jesus in there. I would say, too, there are likely other people involved in this. Uh, because both of these guys are prominent men in their culture, they would have had the kind of money that lets you get servants. And so they probably had a bunch of servants going with them to get these uh, spices and uh, putting these all in the, the cloth and, and helping with the burial. So they probably did that. And I would say, too, so... When you look at these guys who served in the Sanhedrin, and you're like, you know, how, how did they do that? How did they maintain that, that role? Well, let me say first, let's not be too judgy on these, on these guys, Joseph and um, Nicodemus and maybe others that were there, uh, because they were working within the midst of a very evil system, and they're trying to work for good. And uh, I'm sympathetic to that. That was a time when if you'd spoken up uh, for your love of the Lord, certainly they would have been kicked out of the Sanhedrin. Maybe they would have been tried. Maybe they would have been killed. And maybe they thought, if I just stay quiet, we can work something good from the inside. But, you know, we, we're surrounded by institutions, companies, even at times our government, where maybe people within those areas are working towards evil. And we have God's people spread throughout all of those. And maybe even you, maybe in your, your company, your, your role, your school, wherever you're at, uh, maybe you feel too that people who don't love the Lord are making decisions that are opposite of what God would want. And I would say too, consider your role in those situations. Maybe you can't be as vocal as you'd like to be uh, for fear of losing your job or opportunities. But let me say this, like Joseph, like Nicodemus, Work for good in the midst of your position. And so when things are handed down to you that you know are evil, that they're counter to the will of God, don't do them. Find a, find a creative way to work God's will instead of the will of evil people who are handing things down to you. Now, it might be that at some point you realize your organization is so corrupt uh, that there's just no redeeming it and you need to step out. 
But if you can work for good in the midst of it, work for good. This is something I know about God's people. God's people, with the help of the Holy Spirit, can be very clever. So in a clever way, in your role within an institution that doesn't honor the Lord, work for the good of the Lord and for his will, all right? So don't perpetuate evil, perpetuate good. And it sounds so funny that you'd have to say, uh, work for good, not evil, because you'd think everybody would agree with that, but not everybody agrees with God on what he sees as good and evil, and that's the problem. So anyway, uh, but this is what these guys were doing. Now, they, they really took a bold step to say that um, they, they never really came out. When they went and asked for the body, and the comment made here is that he had gone and he had asked uh, Pilate, but he had taken courage. He took courage to do that. It did take courage to do that. Because when you go get that body down, like if you just picture in your mind, removing a body from a cross, like it's nailed to the cross. Like you got to pry out those nails You've got a gruesome, grotesque body that's limp and dead, and you got to take it down. I mean, it's a lot of work in that. Like, if you really think about it, like, that's really grotesque and horrible. And, and here he is doing this. And while Joseph and while Nicodemus are doing this, others would see them. And they'd be like, aren't you the guys that put him here? And then somebody's going to mention to somebody who's back at the Sanhedrin, did you know Joseph and Nicodemus came and took the body? Like, they, they are taking a stand. And uh, so, again, let's be sensitive to them. Okay, but I would say this. There are others who speak out, and even in Scripture, they're going to speak out, and suddenly they'll all become real bold, and all sorts of people are going to lose their lives when, when things turn, and there's all sorts of persecution. But uh, we, too, need to be people who live out loud for Jesus. So if I say to you, Romans 1.16... Who knows, just off the top of your head, probably what Romans 1.16 is about. I won't call on anybody. So if you know Romans 1.16-ish, put your hand in there. Oh, okay. Too few people. I know there's a few. You didn't raise your hands. You're embarrassed. I got it. Uh, let's all, read. The, we're going to read the verse, and then you're going to memorize it this week. This is like, as a Christian, you should know this verse. I'm just putting that out there. All right. So this is what it says. I'll read this verse. I memorized it in a different version. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay, now I'll admit, it doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> there's, some, there's some stuff in here. But if you just got the first part, I am not ashamed of the gospel, you you pretty much have it at that point. Uh, then you just got some bonus there. Uh, this is great. So there's this Christian speaker I used to love years ago. And he was talking about how he would travel. And he had this guy that would open for him before he spoke. And so he had these two guys that traveled together. And uh, before they would go out to do their events, uh, they'd spend a night at a hotel room. When they'd wake up, um, the one guy, the, the opener, would roll over. And he would say to the guy who speaks and would deliver the gospel, he'd say, hey, you know, good morning. How you doing this morning? And he said the other guy, the first thing he always said every morning was he would wake up, roll over, and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And, uh, and the guy was like, listen, uh, you know, good morning would be fine. Uh, but, uh, but the idea was good. That like this guy who was going around preaching sometimes in hostile environments was going out and he was like, listen, I know what defines me. What defines me is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want the world to know I'm not ashamed of it in any way. So that's in itself a really beautiful thing. So, all right, um, that's what's going on there. Romans 1.16, I want you to memorize that. I, like, I'm not even kidding. Like, <laughs> write that down, make a note of it, memorize it this week. And for somebody right now that's thinking, I don't memorize scripture well, especially you. Because you, that's a lie we tell ourselves so we don't have to follow through with it. But you made it through school, a lot of you, or you're in school right now, and you, you've had tests and exams, you can memorize. So just commit yourself to it, and it's good. you'll love it. And, and It'll help you just uh, wake up in the mornings and, and scream it out loud. It'll be fun. Your family will love it. All right. Uh, let's move on. Uh, just a couple more verses. Verse 44. So Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. All right, so here we are. These guys are taking a stand. Um, we do know history tells us, people uh, watched to observe, that generally it takes two to three days for somebody to die after being crucified. Right? It's, it's horrible that we would record that information and know it. But anyway, we do. Um, and so that's why Pilate was surprised. Is, is he dead already? He shouldn't be dead already. Is he dead already? And so he has to verify that. And if you remember, the other thieves that were hanging beside Jesus, they weren't dying quickly enough. 
So they came and they smashed their legs so they would not have the strength to push up and get the air they needed to continue living, which is all sorts of brutal going on there. But uh, there we are in the midst of that. Um, and the women, the women were watching. I, I really appreciate the women who followed Christ, uh, just as I still appreciate women who follow Christ today. But it was a different culture back then. as a very patriarchal, male-dominated, chauvinistic society. Uh, women were treated as less than men. Uh, their testimonies weren't honored in court. Uh, it, was a, it was a weird thing. Um, and so if you were a woman back in that day, you would have you would have hated it because of, of how you'd been minimized. But one perk is um, you could follow Jesus anywhere. <laughs> like, nobody's going to arrest you. Like if you're a woman who stood up and said, I love Jesus and I follow Jesus, the authorities would have been like, no big deal. Like, okay, whatever. Like they would treat you like, oh, you don't know any better. But this is why at the end of Christ's life, you don't see a lot of men around. Because if, and there were some, but if the men had spoken up, they risked being arrested. They risked being tortured or crucified. So that's why the men tend to vanish at this. And I can only imagine as the women were gathered there watching Jesus die, as horrible as that would be, thinking to themselves, we'll probably be the ones who have to get him off the cross. We'll probably be the ones who prepare him for burial. We'll probably be wrapping his body. Like these are all things that they're thinking as they're watching him die, just grief stricken, I can imagine. But then this unbelievable thing occurs. Unbelievable thing occurs. So let's go uh, to chapter 16. Let's go forward in our story. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. All right, so let's, let's just pause there. So it's, the Sabbath is passed, and for them, it's the first day of the week. The first day of the week for them was Sunday. Um, their Sabbath would have been Saturday, and so they've gone there. And it mentions uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary, and Salome. But again, just like with Joseph and Nicodemus, there probably were other people there. I mean, there's probably other women that had gone. Now, they know at this point, the body's already been taken down, prepared for burial. It's been put away. They, they probably heard it was Joseph and Nicodemus uh, went out and did that. Uh, but what they're doing is they're going to anoint a body that's already dead to keep it from stinking as it decays. This was something you would do for a loved one. And so they would go in and they would, they would put these aromatic spices on him to keep his body from stinking. It says they went out very early of the first day of the week when the sun had risen. Okay, so the sun was already up when they went out. So you don't have to do a sunrise service at Easter because the sun would already be up, right? So that's why at Sand Hills we don't do a sunrise service because we want to be biblical. <laughs> so... Uh, I would just say this. Um, you know, we're, we are going to have three services on Easter. Our first will be at eight. The sun will probably already be up. That's okay because that's in line with scripture. Uh, if you want a sunrise service, I would just say this. Come to the eight o'clock service and then we will all take comfort in knowing that the sun is rising somewhere. So as global Christians, we are participating in a sunrise service. It's a great thing. So that'll be uh, 8 o'clock, but we'll do the other services as normal on, on that day as well. So they come, uh, sun's already up, and uh, they go to the tomb. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the tomb thing a second. So I did some reading on tombs, first century tombs. Now this one uh, and, and others of the day were normally because uh, they were quarrying for rock and as they're mining rock, they left behind these cavities in the, the walls of the sides of mountains and things like that. And so then others would come along and they would finish it off and make tombs out of these things. Now you had to be wealthy to do this. Uh, so the wealthy would come along. So they said that the, the basic structure of a tomb in the first century was this. So they would come and they would carve what they called an antechamber, like the the prior to the main chamber. So you would go in through a low doorway and you would go in and then you'd be like in a small room. And then it said that the entrance to kind of the, the, the crypt area, if you will, was about two feet tall. So two feet, so I, like, I got out my tape measure and I was like, two feet, how, you know, like, and then I'm, so like, you know, two feet's like down here. And then I'm thinking, that's what you'd crawl into to get to the dead bodies? No, no. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. If you died in the first century and I was responsible for you, we would let nature take its course. <laughs> Just wherever you are. This is a circle of life thing. We'll let God's creatures reproduce your life into theirs. And whatever's left, somebody will take care of. You know, that's, I mean, there's no way. And if you think about this, you're going to, the t you're going to a tomb. And I know it's already morning. It's more like, because like, you know, I'm not, graveyards don't bother me. But a graveyard at night is not enjoyable, right? And let's just say at midnight with a, a low rolling fog over the cemetery, no, we're, we're good, we're good. I'll see you in the morning. Um, 
you know, and so here are these, these ladies, and so they've got to have a torch with them, right? That's the only way to do this. So you'd have to go in there, and if this was set up that way, so now you're in, and where the dead bodies are, you've got to get down on this thing, and with your torch, right? And these are, you got hair and all, like, how are you going to, so, and they have to get in there to get to the body, and then drag in all the spices, and to take care of him. But, but something happens, so let's, let's go a little bit forward, forward here. Uh, so verse four, uh, and looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. And it was very large. All right, before we go forward, the stone had been rolled back. All right, so you're going to a tomb. You have to crawl inside. You're already kind of aware of how this thing works. You get there, you're about to crawl inside. When you show up, the stone is already rolled away from the entrance. All right, what's going on at this point? Like, you got to, okay, a couple things could be going on. One, grave robbers. Very common in their day. And they may be thinking, oh, the, the followers of Jesus, maybe they put coins around his body or something like that, and let's go in and steal him. So that might be a grave robbing thing. Or could be that other followers of Jesus had the same idea you did, but you didn't communicate about it. And you didn't know that another group of Jesus followers had already gotten spices, and maybe they're in there already doing the same thing. And so, you know, what's going on here would be what they're thinking as they approach. Now, as a side note to all of this, um, one thing I would encourage you in your Bible study, it has always beneficial when you read one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, to read the other gospel accounts as well to get other details that aren't shared in just this one. Because this is how the gospel writers kind of did it. If you and I spent the day together and, uh, and we go through a number of events in the course of that day, and at the end of that day, somebody says to us, you know, the stuff you guys experienced today is so powerful, you should both write it down. And so that evening, we both sit down with pen and paper, or in this day and age, our computers, and we wrote out our story of our day. Well, the next day, if somebody read those, they would see that there's a bunch of similarities, but each of us includes details that the other didn't. Now, it doesn't make them contradictory. It just means that as God worked through our personalities and our memories, each of us articulated different things that enhanced the story. And so if you did that with this, you would find that other gospel writers uh, talk about some other things, like when the tomb was closed, it was sealed because the Jewish leader said, didn't we hear him say something about rising on the third day? That like, there's something in there. Please set a guard at the tomb and that a guard of soldiers uh, showed up and they were at the tomb overnight. Uh, but then an angel <laughs> came down and uh, put the fear of God into those soldiers who initially passed out, then ran away. And then he rolled the, the, the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but to let people in. And, uh, and then he sat there on the stone. Like these are other things that you would find out. So there's other details, uh, including the idea that there were actually a couple of angels that showed up at one point, um, although here we're going to end up with just one. So, okay. So looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. Verse five, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Okay. Let's talk about what you don't expect to find in a tomb. So um, you're crawling through. The door was open. It was weird. Hello. Hello. Anybody in here? Hello. All right. So you're going through, you got this thing, you're down, you poke your head through the door. Now, have you ever entered into a dark room, turned on the lights, and somebody was sitting there? Have you ever had that experience? So uh, this a few months ago, we had some friends staying with us, and um, he wanted to go run. I like to run, and so he said, do you want to go running in the morning? It's like, let's go running in the morning. That'd be great. So I get up early in the morning. My wife's still asleep. My little puppy's still asleep. And um, you know, I'm sneaking around, getting ready, getting my stuff together, and I go into my front room. But it's all dark, right? So I'm trying to, get, trying to be really quiet. So I go into my front room. I turn on the light, and he is sitting in a chair in the middle of the room looking at me, right? And so I'll be honest with you. Kind of a jump scare at that moment. Like, <laughs> what's going on? You know, I peed a little. You know, it was like, it was just one of those moments where you're like, Dude, don't do that to me, man. Don't do that to me. So in the midst of that, that's kind of this thing going on here. Because I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, an angel of the Lord. There's probably the supernatural sense of peace. Like, there is not at all. That's not at all what they, in fact, in fact, they say that when they go in, they see this guy in the white robe. They're alarmed. And the fact, if you go to the end of this, they run fleeing from the tomb. They freak out over this whole thing. It is a totally scary moment, which you would imagine should be. It doesn't matter how sweet he is. In fact, that almost makes it creepier. Like, if I go in and there's a, a freak in there and he's like, ah, you're like, okay, I expected that. I mean, you know, like, like, if you're going to be a wacko, you're going to be a full-on wacko. But if I pop in and there's a nice, smiling young man going, good morning, how you doing? Like, that's worse. I, I think that's a little bit worse, right? Just be the horror that I expect, you know? Don't be the weird, now it's broken. So, goes in there and he, he makes this comment, which is so funny. He says to them, do not be alarmed. <laughs> don't be alarmed. Yeah, it's too late. It's too late for that. Don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, true, uh, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? 
but go tell his disciples and Peter, I love that, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. All right, uh, so now this is, this is peculiar. There's some weird stuff going on here. Um, so in the midst of this, they go there, they see the angel. Had, has it ever struck anybody when you read this story that the disciples aren't gathered around the outside of the tomb waiting for him to come out? Has it ever struck you that women are showing up with spices to anoint a dead body that will stink for the next days, weeks, months until it decomposes? Does that sound weird to anybody? Because wasn't this just this idea communicated very clearly from Jesus that he was going to be killed and rise on the third day? Well, let's back up a little bit, and it's going to tie into this idea of the whole tell the disciples and Peter, which is a weird comment. Now, there was this moment where after the Passover supper, the disciples go out into the garden. Mark records it for us, Mark 14. Uh, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, this was the very moment where Peter spoke up and it was like, hey, Lord, listen, don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to you. Like, as I, I promise you, no matter what, I'm going to be with you to the end. I got you. Like, even if these guys point to the other disciples, even if all of them bail, I'm your man. I got your back. And this is where Jesus is like, you know, Peter, dude, you're the worst. I mean, <laughs> you're going to be the worst of them all. Like, you're going to deny me to my face. Rooster's going to crow. People will be reading about this until I come back. You know, it's like that kind of thing. Um, and Peter's like, no, Lord, that would never happen. And of course, it all happened. It, I mean, Jesus denied, uh, Jesus was denied by Peter in his presence, so much so uh, that one of the gospel writers writes that when Peter denied him for the final time, that Jesus looked at him. I mean, I just cannot imagine failing Jesus in his presence. I mean, heart, the heart of Peter must have been totally shattered at, at that point, which is why when you come back here and he says, um, hey, don't be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, blah, blah, blah. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Because like initially you'd be like, well, isn't Peter one of his disciples? <laughs> but yeah, but Jesus knows like, listen, I know my boy's broken. Please, please go tell him. I'm thinking about him. I care about him. I plan to see him too. Because I would even wonder this, if when the disciples hear, hey, like, hey, listen, you're sp we're supposed to go meet Jesus uh, because he wants his disciples to gather with him in Galilee, that maybe Peter would be like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going. Like, I can't, I can't do this. And it's like, no, 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 you too, Peter. You're still in. You're still in, Peter. You're not out. And I love this comment made to, to appeal to Peter. It's a beautiful moment. All right, uh, but go tell his disciples. Now, just for memory's sake, Mark chapter nine, verses 30 through 32, we studied this chapter uh, months ago. Uh, this is what we read. They went on from there and they passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And those, that last sentence just defines Jesus with his disciples. And honestly, a lot of my walk with Jesus as well. <laughs> well, just this whole idea that, listen, you don't get it, but you're afraid to ask him. And I, I did love that, that Jesus would say things and the disciples would stay quiet knowing they didn't understand what he said, but knowing they also didn't want to be embarrassed by saying they didn't know. And I can't help but think if Jesus showed up today and was teaching us verbally, there's a lot of us that would be sitting there going, I don't, I don't even know what he's saying. <laughs> I hear the words and I can't tell what he's saying but then you think i'm not going to say anything so don't get found out but here's the thing about jesus he already knows <laughs> he knows you don't get it so the next time you're reading the bible and you're like i don't i don't know what's going on here just tell jesus like jesus you know i don't get this help me understand this you know and then we'll trust with some good bible study you'll be able to figure that out but anyway uh, that's what's going on is these guys are trying to process this and now they have to be told by the angel go you're going to find him um and then verse eight and they went out and they fled from the tomb all right i do love the side they run away trembling uh and astonished and uh they were seized with this they had nothing they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid um and they said nothing to anyone for a while like it probably was that as they're running in terror to get back home that probably people were saying to them i mean you're if I see somebody, if you saw somebody running in a dead heat with fear on their face from a graveyard, would you be curious as to what's going on? For sure, I'd turn around and walk the other direction. Like, I, I no longer want to go near that graveyard, right? So, like, you, and you, and so probably people are like, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Everything okay? Everything okay? And they just, they run in fear. They don't say anything until they get back into a different environment, and then they, they speak and say what they've seen. Now, when we get to the end of verse 8, probably some of you 
have a space in your Bibles, your online version. Uh, anybody have something like that? A little space with a note there? Yeah. Uh, note probably says something like this. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include uh, verses 9 through 20. All right, so here's the thing in the history of Scripture. So uh, the Bible, as it was being reproduced, um, took different tracks uh, in different places, and there are different collections of early works that were reproduced. And it seems like probably in the earliest and most reliable manuscripts, the rest of Mark, verse 9 and following, was not actually a part of the earliest manuscripts. And so it's, it's here for our sake to read what was there. But for the most part, I would say this, that as, as Christians then, we don't really put our full weight on verses 9 and following. And if you're sitting there going, it's the Bible. Like, okay, hold on. It, it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that it may not be as reliable content. And maybe, and here's the bigger issue, maybe not directly from Mark. And it was probably a, a believer who put in some extra notes uh, for us that aren't wrong. And I would say this. I heard somebody say this. Like the rest of Mark, verses 9 and following, basically can be found everywhere else in Scripture. So there's nothing here that contradicts Scripture. Uh, there's one curious comment made. We are going to study this, the rest of this next week. There's one curious comment made, and it's, it lends itself to some weirdness, uh, but we'll save that for next week and we'll have fun with it then. Um, but for now, we're going to end here where probably Mark planned to end his story. But if you went forward, if you went forward, all he's doing is going to talk about people that saw Jesus. Like in verse 9, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Uh, and then they'll go on to say, uh, after these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country, and they went back and told the rest, uh, but they did not believe them. So the, the summary of his post-resurrection experiences, this is in Scripture and else, other places. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians, I love this one, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 6 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, who we know is Peter, so he appears to Peter, then to the 12, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And what I do love about this is Paul just openly says, look, all sorts of people, hundreds of people saw Jesus after he was supposedly dead and then resurrected from the grave. And if you don't believe me, go ask him because most of them are still here. So I love that idea that he just throws the gauntlet down, like this is, this is a fact of history. Uh, and then this mention made of people who encounter Jesus. If you take notes, I encourage you to write down uh, Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. Luke 24, starting in verse 13, where you would encounter the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And that's a great story. Go read it. I won't spoil it for you. But, but here's what I love about this. One of the struggles, I think, for us as we study Scripture is if you're not careful, you look at it and you think, oh, wow, how amazing would it have been to be a part of that time when all of that was going on? Or maybe you go to the Old Testament and, and you look at how, he, at how God worked in the history of, of creation and you're like, wow, like from Adam and Eve moving forward and you got, the, you got, you got uh, Moses and, and, and David and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and uh, you got these prophets, you got these kings, all these famous people. Then you get to the New Testament uh, and you got Joseph and Mary and how uh, other people are involved, pulled into the story. You got the, the disciples that you know by name. And, and you think to yourself, man, how amazing would it have been to be a part of all that? Like that's just something that happened then and now we live in this oblivion <laughs> now. Can, can I just tell you? It's the same God. It's the, he's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. Those people haven't ceased to exist. They've only ceased to exist here. And if you're sitting here thinking, man, I just wish, like, you don't have to wish. This same God that has done all of this remarkable stuff through history is doing remarkable stuff in your life right now. Like, you're the people that kids are going to talk about, that grandkids are going to talk about, that they're going to refer back to. Like, who for you is, you know, an icon of faith? And they're going to say your name. Because this God who indwells his people, who responds to those who seek him, is still moving to this day. So like when we hear things about this revival going on, we're like, oh, wow, you know, like I want to be a part of that. Like you don't have to travel to find God. He's right here right now. Father God, thank you for this reminder today that you are the same God, the God of the past, the God of the current, the God of the future. You're not the God of the dead, you're the God of the living. And for all of us here, you will work in our lives as we live here, 
and you will continue to work in our lives as we live in your kingdom forever and ever. Lord, to you be the glory in your holy name. Amen.